Hi, I'm Gil Kennedy, President and CEO of Harco Credit Union. Today I have the true pleasure of interviewing Chuck Moore, Police Chief of the Town of Bel Air. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you very much, Gil. Well, nice, Chuck, to, nice to talk to you. I certainly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me about the, yourself and then the role of the Police Chief in the town. Uh, I've been a Hartford County resident my whole life. We go back, my families go back several generations in Hartford County. Um, I think the first time that I really started to become impressed with a, with a law enforcement background is when actually my family was a victim of a burglary when I was a young boy and a Maryland State Trooper pulls up on the scene and I'm like, that guy looks really sharp in that uniform. And uh, from there, it kind, of, uh, it kind of escalated and evolved. And the next thing you know, I'm in the Maryland State Police Academy in uh, June of 1988. Uh, and from there, uh, my career continued for 26 years, kind of jumping around all over the state. Uh, I finished as a uh, captain with the Maryland State Police at headquarters, uh, kind of doing some statistical, statistical work and supervision of a, uh, of a new dispatch unit um, that was there. Um, and uh, I also, while in the state police, I was temporarily assigned at one point to be an interim police chief in Perryville, Maryland. And that's kind of where I got the itch to, uh, to, to maybe look into uh, a, a police chief job um, things kind of fell where they were, where they, where they ended, and I, uh, next thing you know, in 2015, I'm the, the chief in, uh, the police chief in Bel Air after retiring from the Maryland State Police. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. There's a lot of little moving parts in the middle there, but uh, I'll keep it short for you for time's, uh, for time's sake. So what, is, what does the role of police chief entail in a town of Bel Air? Well, um, Bel Air is not uh, enormously large like many people think. Uh, we encompass uh, one specific zip code, not two. So basically there is a Bel Air proper, which is 21014. We are not uh, involved or the jurisdiction does not include 21015 and many parts of 21014. We're actually only 3.2 square miles. Uh, we have uh, over 10,000 people as, as part of our population. Uh, so we're relatively small. So a lot of times being the police chief, I am the chief cook and body uh, bottle washer, as, as you say, as you might, uh, the saying goes. And a lot of times I'm involved in uh, many different things, including uh, going out handles, handling some calls for service if patrol is short. Uh, I might end up sitting in dispatch to give our dispatchers a break. Uh, and then, you know, the, the 5,000 foot view is that uh, I've got to try to make the quality of life in Bel Air as best as possible, which includes oversight of all the criminal activity that happens in the town of Bel Air, because in the small town, uh, we're a municipality. Uh, we have our own police department. We're responsible for everything uh, that happens criminal wise or uh, safety wise with a criminal element or a traffic safety element attached to that. We're responsible for that. So maintaining the overall quality of life is my overall responsibility. So monitoring the crime, comparing the stats between one year to the next to see if there are spikes that we've got to uh, pay attention to, uh, if there are uh, uh, a higher number of crashes occurring at certain locations, addressing that, uh, whether it's through engineering uh, needs or uh, more traffic enforcement uh, or touching base with the community to see if there's another problem that we might not understand totally. So, I mean, it's, it's a whole gamut of things that, that I'm responsible for. Uh, but again, maintaining and ensuring that the overall quality of life for the citizens uh, is my primary goal. Well, you, you all do a wonderful job. And we're, mm -hmm. so, Thank you. We uh, try. Grateful for your support yep. and, and your efforts uh, in, in making our community safe. So do you work with your the other police departments in Hunter yes. County, the mm -hmm. county police department, uh, uh, Aberdeen? And we, we do. Uh, we, um, we communicate regularly. Uh, in fact, we have a police commission meeting tomorrow where uh, all of us kind of compare notes and go over um, uh, quality of life issues or any kind of issue for that matter that um, maybe one police department can help with resources, uh, sharing, that kind of thing, or, you know, uh, brainstorming uh, on a problem. Yes, we, we, work, uh, we work closely with all of them, yes. 
Well, you know, uh, mid-March was a uh, inflection point mm -hmm. that, that changed the way uh, our normal lives uh, went. So, how has your department and policing activity changed during this period? There has been a whole lot of things that have happened this year that have uh, seemed to change the um, uh, outlook or uh, perspective from police departments all over the country. Uh, who would have thought that uh, we would have be we, we would be facing a uh, uh, pandemic, COVID-19 issues? Uh, who would have thought that uh, you know, we would be looking at that at the beginning of the year? But I mean, that's life. Things 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 twist and turn and change. Uh, quite frequently, and you know, police departments to to stay um, to stay part of the community to to be successful, you have to be able to uh, change with the times. So, uh, yes, we've certainly we've certainly changed because of the COVID pandemic, um, and we've uh, we instituted a bunch of uh, steps that I think that uh, that helped us kind of navigate that uh, that perilous little journey there that we continue to. Uh, to feel right now, you know. Um, what, what were some of those steps that, that you took? So some of the steps that we we took, of course, you know, we we um, and again, we're a small department, and we have to watch what's going on nationwide, locally, um, statewide. We have to keep in touch with uh, all of our partners uh, in the uh, uh, in the healthcare business, you know, uh, and in the state government. Uh, because uh, March 5th is when the governor uh, instituted the first executive order mm -hmm. that says, hey, these are the rules and laws that we have to follow to make sure that uh, the impact of COVID-19 is, uh, is, is not going to um, impact us as much as we can help it. So here is the, here is the rules, here's the laws, and I'm divvying it out to all the jurisdictions, um, you know, uh, the municipalities, the counties. Here's the, here, are the, here are the laws, and it's up to you locally. It's up to the uh, officials statewide to make sure that these laws are followed. Uh, and then you have the Maryland Department of Health, who are also involved, uh, and our local health departments, uh, and they also have rules that we have to stay we we have to stay on top of. Um, and you know, we've. Um, all of our institutions, all of our establishments, businesses, um, they've done very, they've done a great job in the town of Bel Air. Of course, there's been instances where we've had to pay visits to some of these locations and say, you know, give them a little reminder that, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to see some things here that uh, make us concerned. And, you know, we're all, you know, the cliche, we're all in this together, but it truly, we are all in this together. Uh, and we have to do our best to uh, lessen the blow of this, this thing happening. And, and everybody's been extremely cooperative. We haven't had to go out two or three times to these places and remind them once we stop in and they see us, uh, whether it's, you know, sometimes it's my job, this is my town, I'll go in off duty to see what's going on. And, you know, whether it's business, whether it's, uh, uh, I guess, maybe a little selfishness when I want to go in and enjoy a good dinner because we have great establishments here, or, um, maybe a, an adult beverage here and there. Um, I, I just see everybody doing their best to conform and, and make sure that this, uh, that this COVID-19 uh, hits us as little as possible. And I think we've done a great job on that. Yeah, and I, I believe that, uh, you know, this county uh, and our town uh, really has abided by the social contract. Yes. I, 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 that, yeah. uh, you know, we all need to, we have an obligation mm -hmm. to not only our, ourselves, our families, but to each other. Absolutely. And, yeah. um, you know, I, it, it's, um, you, you, you talk about the executive order, so, and I never thought about it, but the executive order aspect is another set of rules and regulations that you all have to become familiar with. In addition to the laws that we have yes. on our books currently. Yes. I never even yeah. thought about that. That's very interesting. So the big thing, again, it's, uh, you know, and again, there's been probably a dozen or more uh, alterations, iterations, amendments, etc. cetera, that uh, myself and uh, all the leadership in the town, the commissioners. Now, remember, our commissioners, they, they you know, it's, it's almost a voluntary position. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they get paid very, very little for the tremendous amount of work that they do here, and mostly they're involved in all of the uh, 
uh, and all the all of the communications. I mean, at once every when it first when the pandemic and I think it's a, it's a pandemic, right? Not an epi I, I always get that confused. But but anyway, uh, when it first started, we were having weekly, daily meetings with uh, officials all over the state and our commissioners, our uh, town administrator, our leadership, all of our leadership was on these messages. And we, we had to uh, we had to adjust uh, uh, an, an incredible uh, amount. We had to expend an incredible amount of effort to stay on top of that, including making adjustments to uh, keep our employees safe, um, you know, from this, you know, because we're in the business of, of public service. We're interacting frequently with people. We had to, we had to institute steps, create policies. Uh, we, we personally, um, probably seven or eight different policies we've had to create with instructions for our employees on dealing with a, uh, a person uh, that could be, you know, uh, that could be exposed to COVID, you know, or could be a COVID patient. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with this kind of thing? We had to do that to keep our employees safe. We've, uh, we actually adjusted schedules uh, to reduce the chance of exposure. Less employees here means, you know, if we do have a, uh, an exposure, less people get exposed to it if we don't have as many working. Um, so we've had to do that. Um, and again, going out and, and, and ensuring that establishment and our public and our community is doing the best that they can to reduce the chance of uh, uh, of, of COVID impacting our town. And I think I think it's gone very well. We've had a couple very close calls uh, in that arena, but uh, we've we've navigated in. And I think because we've stayed on top of things, uh, it has reduced our chance of getting, you know, knock on wood impacted here in the town of Bel Air, um, you know, because really, we're responsible for everything in the town, and if our uh, if our pool of employees is impacted by something like that, it's it's going to hurt really yeah, bad. The yeah. consequences of a, absolutely a, you know, something happening to your department mm -hmm. yes. has implications. Yes. Um, yeah. Thinking back to prior to March, March 16th, mm -hmm. March 5th, uh, that timeline, uh, opioid addiction was paramount in uh, efforts to control yes sir uh, that yes. so talk uh, obviously <clears throat> that didn't go away no. but talk to me a little bit about uh, you know how that has continued to be something that is critical to uh, deal with yes the um, the opioid issue is something that is, is still of paramount um, consideration for me uh, and the department here um, you know I think uh, I truly, you know, even with you, I don't think anybody has not been touched by the opioid epidemic out here. Um, and it's, uh, I think really, I started to, it started to really affect me around 2017 uh, when the uh, number of opioid overdoses really started to climb, substance use disorder really started to get on my radar when I was going to some of these calls for service in our own town. And, you know, um, I've done this, this is 32 years, but there's a point where, you know, you see a young man or young woman lying in a bed who just died from overdo an overdose, mm -hmm. families running around screaming, little kids running around screaming and crying. Uh, you know, we have, a, we have a tendency as law enforcement office, officers to become a little bit hardened. And, you know, there was a point where maybe I, I had passed that and I saw my officers starting to pass that point too, where it was uh, starting to affect their morale, that they were going to two or three overdoses per week. And, you know, we decided that, look, again, the 5,000 foot view is the quality of life here in town. And it was starting to, um, it was starting to deteriorate the quality of life in the town of Bel Air. So at the end of 2017, we ended up with 33 overdoses. Uh, and five, five fatalities mm. that year. So we started, um, the protocol at the time when you have an overdose was to give them a card, to give the uh, person that overdosed a card, say here, you know, call this number if you want to get help. And, you know, these people that are, you know, starting to communicate with other law enforcement leaders and to, to get the bigger picture, you realize that, hey, you know, they're, they're not likely, you know, going to use that card. You have to use a little bit more horsepower, um, you know, a little bit more of a pushing kind of thing to go into the program 
to push that person uh, in the direction of recovery. So what we started, we started a new program, we called it DART, and you know, I, I'm not gonna take credit for it. It was actually instituted initially out in Cumberland, Maryland, but because chiefs communicate, we have these, um, you know, we have conferences and things. I got the idea and I, I, I you know, with permission, I stole the idea from Cumberland, uh, instituted it here and it started in January of 2018. So basically what that program is, when an officer goes to um, an overdose, whether it's in the hospital setting environment or at a home environment, they, you know, um, they kind of say, hey, look, here's, here's the program that we have here in the town of Bel Air. We'll get you behavioral health, health assistance uh, as quickly as possible. You know, all you need to do is just sign here. And then um, the program evolved to where we try to get the officer away because when they see a uniform, that, that's a, an instant turn off for most people. But, um, you know, and you ha also have to get buy-in from your officers. And I was pleasantly uh, surprised that most officers, they, you know, they, they bought into it and they started to do the program. And uh, we started to get, uh, we started to get participants. Um, so when a person agrees to um, participate, Behavioral Health gets involved, Family Children's Services, Hartford County Office of Drug Control Policy. We formed a little coalition. You know, you know, they, another cliche is the silo effect. You know, before uh, you had the behavioral health uh, professionals, they were over here, law enforcement was over here. So we started to work uh, together. And the level of enthusiasm from that sector, I was also very surprised at. They were like, yeah, well, we, we want to help you. Let's get to the front of this thing. So we started to get participants. Um, behavioral health was there. Uh, they had a case manager that would get that person the service that they need. And a lot of times, these uh, addictions, they're related to other trauma that might be in the person's past. Mm -hmm. So that's what their specialty is. They're experts. Get to the bottom of what, why this person is, you know, why they're addicted, why they're doing opioids or other drugs. So uh, at the end of 2018, uh, we were actually down to 20 overdoses uh, from 33 total overdoses, but we did have more deaths. Uh, so it's still, it's not good enough. Any, uh, any overdose or any death is not good enough. So we continued at the end of 2019, believe, and I'm, I'm doing these numbers off the top of my head, I think we were down to six overdoses uh, with one death. So um, another way to measure the success of that program, and I don't do a program just to say I'm doing a program, mm -hmm. okay? So I'll stop if it's not working. So we know that the uh, there is a, a prevalence, there is a, an abundance of Narcan out there, which of course, you know, uh, that's a godsend for us and it's uh, reduced the number of deaths and it's out there so uh, anybody can go get Narcan if they have a uh, substance use disorder. So uh, of course we were factoring in, well maybe this, maybe these reductions are as a result of Narcan, but when you start looking before the prevalence of Narcan and studying the number of overdoses happening elsewhere, it seemed that our, um, when we compared current uh, numbers, our overdoses were lower. So it looked like Narcan, you know, it, of course it had an effect, but sure. it looked like something else was working in there too. So we like to think that the program um, is, is uh, successful. Um, now, we go to two, uh, 2020, you've got the COVID, stuff going on, the pandemic. Now you have the opioid stuff. What do you think is happening with the number of overdoses? Yeah. They're starting to go Absolutely. up again. They're starting to go up again. Now, you know, again, just as I said, um, people that suffer from these disorders, you know, a lot of times there's other things that's causing that. Uh, depression, uh, employment, uh, you, know, uh, you know, isolation mm -hmm. from others. All of that stuff, you know, is things that these people have suffered from disorders before. They're starting to go through that again because they can't go to their, they can't go to their methadone, they can't get Suboxone, these things that help them uh, navigate uh, into the, the realm of recovery. They can't get access to that. Uh, they can't go to their meetings uh, to, to discuss things with peer recovery coaches, the people that have recovered and that are helping them. They can't, they can't interact. So we are seeing uh, an increase. We're, we're up to 10 this year with uh, three actual deaths. Wow. So I, I think, you know, uh, I think that that, that could be a, a sign of COVID actually impacting the opioid problem. Now, another thing that we look at is repeat overdoses. Um, before we started our program, we were having repeat overdoses. 
Um, I think maybe we've had one or two over the past couple of years. So uh, I think that's another sign that we're on the right track, sure. um, you know, and with other things going on in the country as far as um, the community saying, hey, you know, maybe maybe we need some more therapists involved in law enforcement. And you know what? I, I don't disagree with that. We didn't, I, I don't have a degree in behavioral health, sure. you know, so let's include them Absolutely. in that stuff. So we actually expanded DART to another program called LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. So with that new program, which uh, ironically just started uh, last month, low level criminal offenders, uh, we're gonna try to get them help uh, through the same avenues that we did with DART, through behavioral health experts, uh, get them included in the process and try to do something different than the traditional cycle of arrest. You know, when you, when you have somebody that committed a crime, low level crime, you arrest them, you, uh, you book them, you prosecute them, you sentence them, and then they're incarcerated, then they might get behavioral health. So with this program, uh, low level crime, low level uh, criminal, uh, as, we, as we can call them, let's say somebody does, uh, committed a shoplifting offense, mm -hmm. Um, we could say, hey, you know, and they're a Town of Bella resident or they live pretty close. We'd say, hey, here's this new program. You have to come to one session and talk to a behavioral health person to try to get you help. If we think, you know, you have a problem, it could, it could even be a financial problem. Sure. Uh, you know, you might have a kid, 18 year old kid who needs cleats for football practice. He goes in at Dick's and steals a, a, a pair of cleats, you know, in the old system, they get booked, he gets a, he or she gets a, uh, a criminal record. They go through the system and nobody addresses the real problem that caused Absolutely. him to go there and steal those cleats. Right. So with this program, we can possibly get that person help, not give them a record, save money with the prosecutorial stuff, not get them uh, involved in an environment where they're talking to other people that might lead them further down the road to crime. So that's, that's the new, um, I guess I'd like to say improved version of DART. So we're not calling it DART anymore, we're calling it LEAD now. Well, it sounds like you were in the cutting edge of that. And you know, bringing uh, a broader definition to public health, yeah. more than just COVID, mm -hmm. uh, and and finding uh, and redefining how policing and support of the community is uh, actually implemented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a tribute to you yeah, and your well, staff. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that uh, you know the town of Bel Air has somebody like you. It's a new concept, that. and and again, if it doesn't work. We'll stop doing it, but um, I think well, I think I, you're on the right path. I think we're on the right path. I think that's the new style of policing that you know we might end up going towards. You know? well, we, we certainly appreciate that yep. in the community. And I know I appreciate that as. Thank uh, you, sir. I appreciate that. Marco Credit yep. Union, yep. And, and being right across the street from you all makes us even feel more safer. Yeah. Um, to wrap up, um, what would you like to leave with? Uh, in, the, in the form of a thought or perspective for my members and, and the community? Um, I, I'm, a, um, I'm a guy that likes this, uh, uh, I like to look at history and there's this guy named Robert Peel. I guess you could say I'm kind of like a Peelian kind of uh, a law enforcement authority in that he believed that the community basically uh, is part of the police department and the police department is part of the community. Okay, we're out here to serve. So if there are things that the community doesn't like from the police department, and we're kind of seeing that across the country with some, you know, with, with, the, uh, with society maybe wanting some change in the police departments, we've got to conform to that. And that's the kind of thought process that, that we follow here. Uh, and again, you know, making, uh, making sure that the best quality of life out there uh, as possible for our citizens uh, is uh, paramount to us. Uh, that's a prime consideration and uh, you know being kind to the community and again uh, the message is you're part of us we're part of you we're only getting paid for this job you're not but uh, we just want you to realize and recognize that and appreciate that and 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 mostly our citizens totally appreciate our police department and the services that we that we give here that's what i've seen uh, it was a little different from where i came from from the maryland state police it's a different perspective um, you know, I wasn't used to officers getting to calls within, I mean, if, this, if it's four or five minutes to get to a call for service, that's, that's mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm pretty proud that, they, uh, that the officers here 
uh, they take pride in that. Uh, and they do law enforcement a little bit differently uh, than what I was used to. And they've taught me a lot, actually. So. Well, we're so fortunate yeah. to have you and, and, and your staff. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Gil. Appreciate I that. appreciate the opportunity. This has been wonderful. Yep. I want to thank you again for um, uh, gracing us with your uh, with this interview. Anytime. And uh, I'd like to say to our members and, and to the community, uh, please like us on Facebook and please share this video with your friends and family. Thank you.